Cool vertices. Cool full vertices on the curve. Okay, so This, this is a, it's a very simple question, and it's still open. Now you might be asking yourself, what do the square peg problem and the Pythagorean theorem have in common? Or what is even the square peg problem? We'll get to that. First, for context, let's look at the classical proof of the Pythagorean theorem. It'll be a bit terse though. Flip the right triangle over and draw the altitude, otherwise known as the height. This dissects the triangle into three similar right triangles. Next, label the sides A, B, and C, and U and V on the two smaller right triangles accordingly. This means A squared equals UC and B squared equals VC. Please check these equations if you do not understand at first sight. Adding these two equations results in a squared plus b squared equals uc plus vc. We can factor out c, obtaining c times u plus v. But you can see from the diagram that u plus v is just c. Hence, we just proved that a squared plus b squared equals c squared for any right triangle. If there are any questions, please leave a comment. However, there is another simple proof that utilizes a square inscribed within another square. And this is where the square peg problem comes in. Inscribe a smaller square inside a larger square. The vertices of the smaller square cut each side of the larger square into two parts, which we can label A and B. Label the sides of the small square as C. The key idea is to make an area argument. The sum of the parts is equal to the whole, meaning the area of the four right triangles plus the area of the small square equals the area of the big square. The area of the big square is a plus b squared, since each side has a length of a plus b. The area of the small square is c squared, and the area of the four right triangles is four times one half times a times b. After doing some algebra, out pops the Pythagorean theorem. Now here comes the premise of the video. I wonder, is it really obvious that we can inscribe that smaller square inside the larger one? Don't we need to prove that square is actually a square? While it isn't difficult to prove, it is certainly non-trivial. We must construct the shape and show it is a square. Via the construction of partitioning each side of the larger square into A and B, we want to show all four right triangles are congruent because their hypotenuses are exactly the sides of the smaller square. Indeed, we have SAS congruence, side angle side. So far we know this shape is a rhombus. If we can demonstrate that one interior angle of the square is 90 degrees, we are done. Since we have congruent triangles, we can label the angles with alpha and beta as follows. The key is to notice that alpha plus beta plus the corner angle of the rhombus sum to 180 degrees but alpha plus beta is already 90 degrees. Therefore, the corner angle must be 90 degrees, and hence, a non-trivial square can be inscribed within another square. Let's explore further the idea of inscribing a square within another square for a proof of the Pythagorean theorem. What if we viewed the larger square as a general curve rather than just a square? Then we do indeed have a special case of the square peg problem for which we have shown there is a solution. And just to note, but you may have noticed by now, as Terence Tell mentioned, the word inscribed may not be the best word to use because the square need not lay completely inside the curve. We only need all four vertices to be on the curve. But curves like this are a no-no because it crosses itself, essentially creating more than one hole. Since the square peg problem is solved for many classes of curves, is a nice activity to create different Jordan curves defined by their parametric equations in Desmos. And then find an inscribed square in the curve. See if you can find more than one. You might ask, how do you even find a square on the curve? 
This isn't all theoretical jargon. You can take what you see on the chalkboard and program it into a computer like Desmos or Python to produce some insightful graphics. And crucially, um, you don't allow the square to have zero length. Okay, then of course it's trivial. Since it'll be near impossible to solve the equations, in practice, this is how we can find an inscribed square in the curve by playing with the parameters. This is the Hilbert space filling curve. If we join the endpoints, it becomes a simple closed curve for each iteration. It looks pathological, but ironically, it's easier to find a square because you have quote unquote more points to work with. In the limit where it fills a 2D space, it must intersect itself, disqualifying it from being a Jordan curve. This is the Koch snowflake, or at least the fourth iteration of it. It is an example of a fractal, which is a very rough curve. However, due to its symmetry, Elizabeth Kelly was able to explicitly find a square in the curve using 10 coordinates. Now if we have an arbitrarily rough curve without any symmetry, you might think just zoom in and the curve will look nicer. The dilemma is that many fractals are self-similar, meaning when you zoom in it looks just as bad. The difficulty with solving the square peg problem is that approximating the rough curve with smooth curves and then taking limits can result in degenerate squares, otherwise known as points. Tiny squares in the approximated curve may degenerate to points in the limit. In the lecture, Terence Tau said the system is determined, meaning the number of variables equals the number of equations. He also said it is a 4x4 system. So then why do we have an 8x8 system for the third curve we saw previously? It looks chaotic. Well, it actually reduces to a 4x4 system. To see this, we say a point is part of the curve means there exists a, b, c, d, and the interval from 0 to 2 pi for the parametric equations. Now let x equal f of a and y equal g of a. We see x and y are both in terms of a, so we can trade two variables for one and plug that into the other three equations. Then from the second pair of equations, we can solve for k and j, and then plug those into the remaining equations. This gives a 4x4 nonlinear system in a, b, c, d. It's actually almost a polynomial system in sine a, sine b, sine c, and sine d, but not quite. Because of trig identities, we can expand sine of 6a into a polynomial in terms of sine a and cosine a. However, cosine a will be of degree 3, which is odd. So we cannot get the system completely in terms of the sine function using the identity sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1 because at some point we would have to take square roots. On the other hand, if we have sine of 5a, then we do get a polynomial with cosine a in even degree. However, the corresponding curve is not simple, meaning it intersects itself. But unlike linear algebra, which has nice theorems for existence and uniqueness of solutions, a nonlinear system that involves arbitrary complicated functions like the sine function is undecidable in regard to its solutions. However, if the nonlinear system is solely polynomial, then there are tools to use from algebraic geometry to decide whether or not a solution exists. Of course, this is all just a demonstration of how difficult it can be to find the vertices of the square even when we have simple parametric equations to describe the curve. Complicated curves may not even have formulas to work with. In this last part, I want to let you think about if it is obvious that you can inscribe a non-trivial square in another square. Is it obvious that you can inscribe an equilateral triangle inside a square? Or maybe it is not even possible. How about a pentagon? A hexagon? It is not too difficult to prove this little theorem about exactly what regular polygons can be inscribed in a square. Only for n equal to 3, 4, and 8. The proof will be in my upcoming book on geometry. If you enjoyed watching this video, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing. And also, if you are learning from the free resources from this channel, then you'll love my book, Learning Isn't Linear, available on Amazon.com. 
It contains crisp illustrations to accompany non-standard problems with extremely detailed solutions. The link is in the description. If you get the ebook version using the Kindle, there are clickable links throughout the book to Desmos and GeoGebra projects. It is very easy to search within the book for specific topics. As you can see, chapters range from algebra to calculus. Whether you are a self-motivated student solving problems on your own, or a teacher preparing for a math class, this book is a valuable resource to add to your repertoire. Okay, till next time, and remember, prioritize long-term learning over short-term test-taking.